Thanks, Bob. I really drew the um, short straw in terms of the timing of my talk. Um, <laughs> So bear with me, I probably will go for about 40 or 45 minutes. <laughs> um, my name's Paul Van Sale. Uh, I'm a South African, and a decade ago, I had the great privilege of serving as the Executive Secretary of our country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'm delighted to be participating in a conference entitled Reimagining America, because in some senses, I lived at a time in which I helped for my country reimagine itself. And so perhaps my experience may help America as it stands at its own very consequential crossroads. It took four years from Nelson Mandela's release from prison to the holding of South Africa's first democratic election. During that time, implacable enemies came to trust each other enough to draft a new constitution and to contemplate a post-apartheid government which, uh, in which they shared seats in a cabinet. One of the most controversial aspects of South Africa's transition was an agreement to grant amnesty to those who had committed human rights crimes during the conflicts of the past. Nelson Mandela concluded that the security forces would not allow a successful transition to democracy without an assurance that they would not be prosecuted for past crimes. Deal-making is often necessary to end a conflict. But it, ca but it contains its own risks from the perspective of building a durable peace. If ordinary people feel that their interests have been neglected, then a peace deal drawn up by elites will quickly unravel. This is particularly true when it comes to human rights crimes. Amnesties are seldom popular with torture victims or the relatives of the disappeared. It was in this context that several of, several of us worked to establish South Africa's Truth Commission. While we strongly supported the transition to democratic rule, we were determined to ensure that it did not occur at the expense of victims. If an amnesty was the price we had to pay for peace, and if murderers were literally able to get away with murder, then the new South Africa would have to make a comparable investment in addressing the needs of victims. South Africa's Truth Commission contained a number of unique innovations. First, it required perpetrators to confess their crimes in public and subject themselves to cross-examination by victims and their lawyers. Only if they made a full and truthful disclosure of their crimes would they be granted amnesty. While this enabled perpetrators to escape imprisonment, it did result in a measure of public shaming and stigmatization. More importantly, it allowed victims to discover the truth about the fate and whereabouts of their loved ones. The commission also allowed victims to testify in public and have their suffering acknowledged by a commission appointed by Nelson Mandela and headed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It was this public testimony by victims and perpetrators, almost nonstop for three solid years, that started the process of South Africa reimagining itself. The revelations dominated the headlines of major newspapers and were the top stories on the nightly news. The Truth Commission's work was impossible to ignore. And so, in order to give you a more intimate sense of the testimony that came before us, I want to tell you one story of one victim who came before us. A woman called Joyce Mtumkulu came to testify before the Truth Commission, and she came in a hall that was very similar to this, except there weren't roughly 500 people sitting in the hall. There were 5,000 people sitting in a hall. And Joyce came to tell the story of her son, Sapiwe. Sapiwe was a youth activist. He was charismatic, he was articulate, and he was organizing against the effect of apartheid in South Africa's schools. And for that reason, he attracted the attention of the security police. He was arrested, he was detained without trial under the emergency uh, uh, legislation that was operative at the time denied access to lawyers and to doctors. And he went into detention robust and articulate, and he came out of detention in a wheelchair, unable to walk, unable to talk, and missing most of his hair. He was immediately sent to a, on a battery of tests, and it was discovered that Sapiwe had been poisoned by the police while he was in detention with thallium, which is a tasteless, colorless, odorless drug. And he was put on a treatment regime, and his health began to improve. And one morning when Joyce Mtumkulu went to the hospital to see him, Sipiwe, 
he wasn't in his bed. So Joyce and Timkulu came before the Truth Commission to tell the agony of a mother whose child has disappeared. And she described nursing him, she described watching him grow from a toddler to a boy to a teenager. She described the enormous pride that she had in Sapiwe, in his bravery in tackling the apartheid state and in her very great fear that it would cause him some harm. And she said, Every time the phone rings, every time there's a knock on the door, and every time I hear footsteps in the corridor, I think it's the Piwe coming back. But I know in my heart of hearts that my child is dead. And then she reached down beneath her and pulled up what looked like a ball of black wool, but was in fact a ball of Sapiwe's hair that she had gathered while he was convalescing. And she held it up before us in the Truth Commission to Archbishop Tutu, but by extension to the whole nation because this was being televised and said, this is all I have left of my son. You need to tell me what happened to my son. Now the killers of Sapiwe and Mtumkulu applied for amnesty and they revealed that they conspired to have him killed to avoid the lawsuit that his lawyers had brought against the authorities. They abducted him from his hospital bed they shot him in the back of the head, they put him on a pyre and burnt his body to ashes, and they threw them into a river. And we were not able to bring back Sapiwe, but we were able to go to that place in the river and give him a decent burial, with Joyce there finally being able to say goodbye to her son. Now I want to show you a brief clip of one of the proceedings of the Truth Commission. It's a man called Ernst Malchas, and it only takes 60 seconds, but Ernst is telling you about torture. I want to ask you a question, but if it is too painful uh, for you to answer, um, that's fine. Okay. Um, you have told us um, today that you were tortured. If you are able to, uh, and you, it's not too painful. Could you describe some of that torture? What, what actually did they do to you? I was always suffocated with a bag. A stick was put behind my knees and against my back. During that period, I was suffocated so that I couldn't move at all. Mr. Malkas, thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. That adjourns the proceedings for today. Uh, we will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed. Michael Ignatieff once quipped that truth commissions never uncover the truth. All they do is narrow the range of permissible lies. And after Joyce Simtumkulu and scores like her told us their story, nobody could deny that the South African security forces abducted and killed their opponents. And after Ernst Malchas and hundreds of people like him testified, no one could deny that the security forces de tortured detainees in the most barbaric and inhuman fashion. Most white political leaders try to run a mile from these harrowing stories. F F.W. de Klerk, South Africa's last apartheid president, described these crimes as aberrations. They were the acts of bad apples and certainly not the result of policy adopted by political leaders. But the mountains of evidence gathered from both victims and perpetrators revealed that de Klerk's account was an impermissible lie. Security force leaders eager, eager to prove that they were acting under orders, not private frolics or acts of pure sadism, provided us with evidence proving their crimes formed part of an approved counter-revolutionary strategy. The brutality revealed to us by victims was too widespread and too systematic to be the result of anything other than policy. 
And it was through the, this process of testimony and revelation that our country began to move from knowledge to acknowledgement. It's one thing to know that crimes occurred. It's quite different to acknowledge that they were wrongful and to promise to never allow them to happen again. The Truth Commission also changed the way many whites imagined South Africa. For them, apartheid was a justifiable social experiment that was abandoned only when the costs began to outweigh the benefits. White South Africans benefited enormously from apartheid and turned a blind eye to the humiliation, the physical violence, and the economic exploitation at its core. A hit squad leader captured it perfectly when he told me, whites wanted to eat roast lamb every night, but they never wanted to see the blood and guts. We were responsible for the blood and guts. The work of the Truth Commission helped to de demolish the wall of denial that whites had built between their pr prosperity and the crimes committed in their name and with their political support. It's very difficult to hear thousands of victims like Joyce tell their story and not conclude that apartheid was a profoundly immoral and an evil system. And it's impossible to be believe F.W. de Klerk's bad apple fabrication after hundreds of security force members revealed that they tortured and killed based on policies approved by political leaders. Which brings me to America and to the national debate regarding how this country should respond to torture and other forms of abuse carried out in the name of the global war on terror. Let me say immediately that I come at this debate not as a meddlesome outsider with a vaguely colonial accent. I have two sons who were born in Brooklyn and they carry American passports. <clears throat> the crimes committed under the Bush administration were done in their name and I fundamentally believe that how this legacy of abuse is dealt with will affect their future. Since my work at the Truth Commission, I've worked to prevent and redress torture in dozens of countries. There's something medieval and primitive about torture. It's also shameful, immoral, and criminal. And for these reasons, most political leaders who support and condone torture have developed systems and coded instructions to encourage its practice while taking great care to retain the ability to plausibly deny you ever authorized it. Based on my experience, I've come to believe that you never have to actually issue written instructions to make torture happen. All you have to do is create the following conditions to allow it to flourish. First, deny detainees their habeas corpus rights. Don't let doctors or lawyers or anyone else have access to them. Second, dehumanize the detainees. Portray them as dangerous fanatics who pose an existential threat to your country. Dehumanization is easier if those in detention come from a different ethnic or religious group. Third, place interrogators under enormous pressure to get information and get it fast. And fourth, ensure that no one is held accountable for acts of torture and mistreatment. If the pressure for accountability is too great, then scapegoat a few bad apples, but always maintain that their crimes are aberrations. These conditions have and continue to apply in dozens of dictatorships and repressive regimes. Not surprisingly, torture is rampant in these countries. They also describe the conditions in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo Bay. But what makes these cases so remarkable is that US officials at the very highest levels went beyond creating the conditions for torture to flourish. Astoundingly, White House and Pentagon officials issued written instructions to authorize torture by stripping prisoners of their legal protections and defining torture out of existence. Just this Wednesday, the former vice president actually publicly admitted to authorizing waterboarding and other euphemistically termed enhanced interrogation techniques. And what distinguishes Dick Cheney's position on torture from leaders like P.W. Buerta in South Africa and Augusto Pinochet in Chile or Alberto Fujimori in Peru was that those leaders always publicly repudiated and denied torture, despite the fact that it was well known that their regimes were responsible for these crimes. Cheney, in contrast, has sought to justify torture, not only as legal, but as moral and as perfectly justifiable. Let me put it more starkly, Dick Cheney has defended tortures, torture in ways that would make dictators blush.
But far more troublingly, Cheney has argued that waterboarding and similar acts are ne necessary and justifiable tools in combating terrorism and that those who oppose them are placing America in great danger. I understand that the origin of this lies in 9-11 and in an understandable impulse to protect America in response to that day of great barbarism. But imagine if every country that experienced similar atrocities or is engaged in a battle that it considered to be an existential threat crossed this fundamental threshold of civilized behavior. All the advances across the globe we've made in human rights since World War II would be quickly jettisoned in the name of a perpetual war against terror. And that is why it's so important that President Obama issued a ban on torture as one of his first acts of office. This was an important first step in restoring America's image of itself and its standing in the world. But I fear that this ban is not based on unwavering political support, either in Congress or from some sections of the American people. It's not hard to imagine how a, a further terrorist attack would quickly lead to a restoration of the old policy. And that's why I think there has to be a truth commission in America. America cannot reimagine itself unless it undertakes a proper reckoning with this dark chapter in its recent past. A few prosecutions of low or mid-level operatives will not produce the transformation this country requires. A new America must confront this dark chapter openly and publicly. It must give victims a chance to testify and allow the American people to hear firsthand unvarnished accounts of the crimes committed in their name. It's only then that America will be able to say to itself in unambiguous terms, we are not a nation that tortures its enemies. We regard torture as immoral and criminal. We will never justify or condone torture and we will punish those who commit these criminal acts. But I fear a more accurate reading of the national mood, or at least the minds of political leaders and opinion makers, sounds something more like this. We're a nation that used to torture. We don't do it anymore. We won't undertake a national investigation or prosecute those who authorize these crimes for fear that it may be too divisive. We may prosecute some low-level torturers who engaged in particularly egregious acts. We can't say for sure we wouldn't torture again in order to prevent or investigate terrorist acts. And it's this national ambivalence about torture that worries me most. I fear that our instinctual opposition to torture has been eroded by the specter of a ticking nuclear bomb in a major US city. So let me suggest several reasons why this nightmare scenario should not be allowed to muddy the water. First, torture is an extremely unreliable method of extracting information. Don't take my word for it ask the FBI. Almost all experienced interrogators will tell you you get much, much more accurate, actionable intelligent, intelligence from lawful interrogations than from torture. Colin Powell can tell you the dangers of relying on information extracted by torture. He repeated a falsehood obtained by torture to the UN Security Council as justification for invading Iraq. Second, Evidence extracted by torture can't be used in civilized legal systems as a basis for obtaining convictions. Once the terrible, one of the terrible dilemmas the Obama administration is facing is how to close Guantanamo, in deciding how to close Guantanamo Bay, is how to prosecute people who could be guilty of serious crimes, but the only way to prove it is through evidence obtained by torture. Third, torture offers bad people and fanatics a propaganda opportunity. There's nothing that shifts attention away from a criminal's own conduct than the fact that they've been tortured. Fourth, if you start torturing because you suspect a person may have information that can stop a major terrorist attack, then why stop there? What about a person who you suspect has raped and may rape again? Why not murder suspects? No one, surely no one could object to torture if it stops another murder. Why not suspected pedophiles? Why not arsonists? Once you start justifying torture, either morally or legally, it will start to infect your law enforcement community and your criminal justice system. The number of innocent people who are tortured will skyrocket, and the country's legal and moral foundations will begin to crumble. And finally, torturing a person till they confess to a crime they may or may not have committed 
is a lazy form of crime fighting. It's a poor substitute for the hard slog involved in police investigations or sophisticated intelligence operations. In Colombia, in Northern Ireland, in Indonesia, and in Peru, terrorist groups have been dismantled and defeated when police officers and intelligence analysts infiltrated their movements, intercepted their communications, followed their money, and monitored their operatives. For all these reasons, I fundamentally believe that in a rational discussion about torture, when all the fear-mongering and all the politicking is stripped away, the policy arguments against this medieval practice will win the day. But far more importantly, I believe that when decent people hear, hear and see human beings offering accounts of torture, then the policy arguments will recede into the background and the moral imperative of, of opposing torture will carry the day. In conclusion, Karl Jaspers, a famous German philosopher, wrote a seminal essay entitled The Question of German Guilt. In that essay, he co coined the term metaphysical guilt and defined it as the guilt we should feel when we fail to prevent the persecution of others. The Danes had metaphysical guilt and as a result, saved more Jews from the Holocaust than any other European nation. This abstract concept, when put into practice, can mean, the, can mean the difference between life and death and between torture and the rule of law. I also like to think of it as a form of enlightened self-interest. America needs a process of publicly repudiating torture, not just because it's wrong, but because once you've opened the Pandora's box of state-sanctioned brutality, the violence and the degradation that follow are seldom confined to your enemies alone. Thank you.